Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to the show today, I want to let you know about the big changes here on our team. We've now got six editors in both Asia and Africa producing some great journalism every day on what the Chinese are doing throughout the developing world. No one provides this kind of daily coverage about the Global South from the Global South. And that's why governments, think tanks, and investors around the world read our newsletter every day and rely on our website. If you'd like to find out what they're reading and get a truly unique perspective on China and the world, subscribe today. Subscriptions are super affordable, and you get 30 days free just to try it out. So go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China-Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. A proud member of the Syndicate Network from SubChina, I'm Eric Olander. And as always, I'm joined by the China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden from Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, over the past, let's say, month or two, we've had a number of discussions related to infrastructure in Kenya in particular. Obviously, the topic of discussion earlier this month, a really big decision came out of the High Court of Mombasa about the standard gauge railway loan contract that any day now the government is supposed to reveal to the public. The government, interestingly, has been very quiet. Kenya's normally very, very aggressive media has been quite quiet on this issue. No follow-up since we've seen that court ruling come out of the uh, the high court in Mombasa. So any day now, we're going to see it. Now, the, the government does have the option, not a legal option, but an option to say, we're not going to do it. Interestingly, another court fight is probably going to start bubbling up very soon over a similar issue for the Nairobi Expressway, where that contract is also being withheld from the public as well, in contravention to both constitutional law and procurement laws in Kenya. So big fights kind of happening on the legal side. But it does point to the fact that Kenya, in many ways, is the current showcase for Chinese infrastructure in Africa. The past two weeks, we've seen the Nairobi Expressway open. It's had some growing pains, Kobus, as you and I have been following on a daily basis. And it's interesting that people have been complaining about the cost. They've been complaining about some of the traffic congestion. This was to be expected, but it is, it's not the reception that I think China Road and Bridge Corporation or the Kenyan government expected. But it does point to this very important test that you wrote about last week. This is a public-private partnership. So the six or seven hundred million dollars that it took to build this 27-kilometer expressway did not add to Kenya's debt. And so if this works, we can see more infrastructure projects following that PPP model maybe start to unfold. Because as we've talked about since last, what was it, November, I think it was, where the data points started to come out showing the massive drop in Chinese policy bank financing for infrastructure in Africa. So lots of key tests, Cobus, on the legal front, on the business model front, and also on the financing side. Yeah, absolutely. And what and what we're also seeing is that, particularly in the case of the of the of the expressway, is that Local opposition, kind of popular complaints about the expressway is proving to be extremely popular, you know, kind of an extremely powerful as a way of of, um, of shaping kind of public to, public opinion about about the issue. And we've seen this in other um, Kenyan pro, um, projects as well, particularly the um, the plans uh, to expand the Lamu port and, and the surrounding areas um, that that got a lot of, of local opposition. And, you know, kind of and because of the, that local opposition, some of those aspects of those projects had to be reshaped. So it's, it's, it's really interesting, you know, kind of the to see the impact of this kind of bottom up kind of opinion you know opinion utterance kind of from from 
people in Kenya. And I think that is going to become an increasingly big issue in, in Chinese infrastructure in other African countries as well. Well, let's take a look now and do a deep dive into infrastructure politics, infrastructure finance, and the complex relationship that African countries now have with the Chinese on the question of infrastructure, simply because, again, we're not where we were in 2007, 2008, when, man, it was like Vegas and money was just flowing out of the Chinese to build, you know, you want a road and you want a road and you get an airport and you get a port. Not anymore. Things have changed a lot. A new paper came out, which was very, very interesting, Infrastructure and the Politics of African State Agency, Shaping the Belt and Road Initiative in East Africa. It looked at three projects, and these are projects we have discussed previously. Tanzania's Bagamayo Port, very interesting project that is now back in discussion after famously flaming out. Uh, Ethiopia's Adama Wind Farms, and also the port expansion project at the port of Lamu Kobus, as you mentioned. It was written by three scholars who were thrilled to have on the program. Two for the first time, one is returning. Frankton Chiamura is a lecturer in international development at the Open University in Milton Keynes. For those of you not familiar with the Open University, the town Milton Keynes may sound familiar. If you're a Formula One racing fan like me, it is the hometown of Red Bull Racing. So Frankton, uh, you know, I don't know if you get to see Max Verstappen and some of the Red Bull guys floating around town very often, but uh, great to have you back on the program. Well, thanks. Thanks to having you as well. And then also joining us from London for the first time on the program, we're thrilled to have Elisa Gambino, who's a fellow in the International Politics of China in the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics. A very good morning to you, Elisa. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And long overdue to have on the program, Tim Zayons is a lecturer in the International Relations and Global Political Economy at the University of Freiburg in Germany, and also an honorary research fellow at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town. A very good, I think, morning to you, Tim. Thanks for having me, Eric. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome. It's great to have all three of you. Congratulations on this fascinating paper. It comes out at a very interesting time, in part because, as we've talked about, there's this transition in funding that's been happening from the Chinese in infrastructure development in Africa. Frankton, let's start with you. Maybe you can kind of speak on behalf of the group, and we're going to deep dive into your particular contributions. But right now, maybe just help us understand the broad strokes of the paper in terms of the state of infrastructure politics in African state agency. Thanks a lot, Eric. So I think um, the main contribution that we are bringing on board uh, with this paper we recently published with the Chinese Political Science Review is trying to understand how African actors, you know, uh, this could be state actors or non-state actors, shape uh, the way they interact with the Chinese, particularly around infrastructure projects um, uh, development. So our key argument, I think, that we are making here is that regardless of the power asymmetries that we observe between African and Chinese actors, we still see a number of arenas or spheres through which African actors are um, able to shape particularly the terms and conditions around uh, developing infrastructure in the respective um, uh, countries that we are focusing on, which in this case is Ethiopia, uh, Tanzania and Kenya. Elisa, in, in the discussion of agency, the, the paper kind of breaks breaks it down into different kind of sets of actors. I wonder if you could kind of hone in a little bit on which particular kind of like sets of actors the, 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 the paper focuses on. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the starting point for the focus of our paper is that we try to really go beyond this idea of thinking of the state as an actor in, in and of it itself um, and sort of to unpack different assemblages that are part of the state and how it's conceptualized. And so to try and bring out some of the spheres in which African agency um, is enacted. So um, we focus on three spheres of African agency, but we also say that these are not the only spheres that um, could be identified. And so we try to focus on political elites, bureaucratic agency, and then agency of local governance actors. So the first one is sort of more of a macro level sphere of agency. It's mainly focused on political elites and the impact that they have in setting the agenda and closing sort of uh, agreements for the development of Chinese-sponsored infrastructure. The second sphere in bureaucratic agency focuses on different bureaucracies. Um, and in the paper, we look at it through the case of Ethiopia and so finding ways in which bureaucracies in African nations can shape uh, the, the processes of infrastructure development. 
And then the third sphere, that's agency of local governance actor, shifts the focus to actors that have perhaps in the literature been marginalized in terms of analytical focus and that are part um, not only of, of government structures, but also uh, communities that um, that live and in, inhabit the areas that where projects are being developed. Um, and so these are sort of our three spheres of focus. But again, there's definitely others at play. And so we, we kind of push, also invite other researchers to kind of build on these findings. Yeah, Tim, so Elisa was talking a lot about agency. It's a word that has bounced around a lot in the in the academic world where you guys are from, you talk about it and you define it. I think it's a very important concept that we might want to just stop before we go much further in our discussion. And if you can try and give us what a definition of agency is, so we understand the concept. Yeah, that's the that's the one million dollar question, I guess. I mean, um, in in both in academia but also in popular discourses, um, there's of course a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about exactly that definition of of, of agency. I guess what, what is one ingredient of agency is, is certainly making a difference. Like even in, in the natural science, an agent is added to, uh, to, to some kind of laboratory experiment and it makes a difference. So in many ways, a, a most basic definition um, to which most scholars would agree is that agency makes a difference to uh, a social setting. Um, in, in, with our paper and, and the discussion has, of course, move, moved on significantly in the last few years, also in the China Africa uh, scholarly circle. Agency, of course, is also closely related to structure. And this is something that we try to also underline in, in, in our paper. And this is also something that relates to what you, Kobus, said in, in the introduction, what you mentioned. That context, for instance, in Kenya, the, this is also why we called it the politics of state agency. Um, of course, there's political contestation in which agency is exerted. And this is, of course, always part of the context, the structural context in which agency takes place. So for us, it was very important to emphasize in this paper, basically, that that very close relationship between various agents that are situated at different positions within the state, be it elites, as, as, as Elisa has mentioned, be it um, bureaucratic agents or even actors involved in local governance in, in Lamu, for instance, who also contested parts of the aspects of the projects. These actors are situated in different structural contexts, and these structural contexts are also highly dynamic. And this is something that we see again, as, as Kobus has mentioned in the, in the, in the introduction, that we see playing out in the context of concrete projects. And this is why we named it the politics of, of uh, state agency. Franklin, in the case of Tanzania, you, you look at Bagamoyo Port, and, and I think the, the discussion that we've seen in the press and so on, the the way that that the kind of ups and downs of the Bagamoyo Port deal has been framed was quite strongly informed by the the personality and the the kind of persona of former President Magufuli. Um, so I was wondering, in your own research there, kind of how did that break down? Like you know, kind of what which aspects of of that kind of idea of Magufuli's centrality and the and the kind of rise and fall of that deal um, actually was actually borne out. I think um, our focus, particularly on the Tanzanian case studies, to try and tease out how political elites, uh, in this case um, uh, the Tanzanian president, uh, managed to shape particularly the implementation terms and condition of the deal. So our first point of departure here was to look at, um, this is from a broad, broad uh, framework, to look at how the politics was playing out, particularly around the aspect of development um, in the country. And we are particularly looking at these authoritarian approaches to development. And our, our, our focus on this, therefore, was to try and tease out how this uh, broader policy framework around development impl uh, impacted on some of the projects um, uh, that were already sort of um, at, at an advanced stage in terms of implementation. And you should take into consideration that this project that we are particularly looking at is not something that was initiated um, by Magafuli, but it's something that was already um, in play. But however... His rise to power and his challenge, particularly around some of the terms and conditions of this of this of this deal, was seen as very very unfavorable to the uh, Tanzanian, and hence uh, the need for renegotiation of some of the um, of the terms and conditions. Well, let's give a little bit of background to the Bagamayo issue. It, we've done a number of shows on this, so if you're interested in this topic, 
I recommend that you go into the archive and you take a look at what we've done. Subscribers can also log on to the site and get access to a number of, of different analyses that we've done on this issue. But it's very interesting because, as Frankton talked about, it was very much the personality of John Magafuli. This deal started under Magafuli's predecessor, President Quinquete, and then Magafuli famously, very colorfully, canceled it. Let's get a flavor, though, of President Magafuli's, or late president, I should say, he passed away earlier this year. Let's get a sense of where he was coming from and some of the terms that Frankton said he found so objectionable. This is some sound from early 2011, 2012, where he explains uh, why he objected to the deal. We paid land compensation in Kingaboni for Chinese workers who came to build the port. Something so ridiculous that it has never occurred in this world. Something stupid. 115 billion shillings were to pay to those in Bagamoyo. If there were workers in Bagamoyo, it probably won't even reach 20. And this investor comes with the most ridiculous condition only a crazy person can accept. They say, if they built a port in Bagamoyo, we won't be allowed to use any other port in Tanga all the way down to Ntuara. Meaning, you are not allowed to construct any port. These were the conditions. They also wanted to be exempt from paying taxes. The Tanzanian Revenue Authority would not be allowed to tax them once they've made the investment. They also wanted us to first give them a 33-year guarantee without questions. We were supposed to give them a 99-year lease that was inconsistent with the laws of this country and you were not allowed to go and ask who was going to invest in that place. Many ridiculous conditions. There, I tried to speak on this so the Tanzanian who've been played with for many years can change. We are supposed to change. We are supposed to change. So there you have it. That is from the late President Magufuli. He was celebrated for that decision in the U.S. and in Europe, where a lot of people saw this as an expression of agency, a real pushback on the Chinese. He famously said only a drunkard, that was his word, only a drunkard would take this deal. I contend, Tim, that he was not as offended by the deal, and it certainly wasn't necessarily a, a break in terms of the Chinese. Magafuli turned out to be a very close friend of the Chinese. It was just on this particular issue, he hated the terms. And what I think he was trying to do is he was following in a little bit the footsteps of what we saw with former president of Malaysia, Mahathir Mohamed, who, again, said very, very harsh things about the Chinese when he wanted to renegotiate railway deals. And he wanted the Chinese to come back with a better deal. This was negotiating, in my view. What? How did you interpret, Tim, what Magafuli's point of view was in terms of what he was trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, all your all your hypotheses are, are interesting, and I would I would uh, certainly sign a few of them. Um, but I think we actually still need to go even further back um, by by basically tracing that particular manifestation of, of, of African agency vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis China. You're absolutely right. Magufuli has a long history in, in negotiating with the Chinese. He was, before he became president, he was held two times the portfolio for infrastructure minister in public works. So he has done a lot of work with, with Chinese companies, also Chinese banks in that, in that portfolio. So some of my interviewees told me that senior interviewees within the Tanzanian government also said that Magufuli knew quite well and knew quite well how to deal and negotiate with, with Chinese counterparts. So in many ways, that would basically confirm what you, what you mentioned. Nonetheless, we also need to uh, go a little bit further back in the polit in, in, into Tanzanian politics because this particular fa fo form of, of economic nationalism that uh, the late President Magufuli came, came on with uh, when he was elected for the first time in 2015, that was, of course, a result of political processes within Tanzania. And um, we, we need to remember that the, the, the ruling party, the CCM, got increasingly under pressure in the in the in the 2000s um basically winning narrower and narrower winning by narrower and narrower margins against the against particularly the the, the opposition party chadema so there was a lot of pressure to deliver in terms of economic development and this is also how magufuli built his 
very populist nationalist form of developmental state that we describe in 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 our paper as well um so so we need to contextualize it again within the politics of of Tanzania and interestingly enough we see this now in more and more african countries but also in other parts of the global south we see that there is more demand, also demand on the streets. Again, Kobus has mentioned it initially, more contestation in the context of development policies and governments getting under pressure. They need to deliver. And this, one might want to argue, results also in different government approaches vis-a-vis -vis Chinese investors, but also vis-a-vis -vis other um, potentially Western um, uh, partners. Very quickly before we move on, Kobus, just a final note on Bagamayo. The current president, uh, Hassan, she has started up conversations again with China Merchant Holdings to resume the discussions about the Bagamayo port. Uh, she's under some political pressure to get things going. There's a lot of port development in Eastern Africa, but she said very firmly that it will be on Tanzania's terms. Not sure what has happened since she started those conversations back in June is when we, knew, we got news of that. Um, Elisa, your, your second um, case study focuses on the, the role of bureaucracies in order to, you know, to, to shape projects. Um, and, and they seem to sit, kind of sit half, halfway between, you know, between the elites in, in Tanzania and then the last case study in Lamu, which is, which is really kind of bottom up. So in relation to the to the bureaucracies, um, both the elites and the bureaucracy, actually, to which extent, um, you know, sh should we think about about agency as breaking down in relay like into the ability to stop certain aspects of a project one is unhappy with, and to which extent have these have these bureaucracies been able to add additional things to the projects that they would also like to see? So is the is the agency you know kind of playing out mostly negatively in terms of like in in dealing with problematic aspects of a of a of a project proposal or is there a kind of a positive aspect of agency where things can really be shaped in a in a in a direction that that this government wanted but that the Chinese or other kind of you know outside counterparts might not have been planning for well, I think talking about, you know, whether it is a positive or negative outcomes, it might not be as productive in terms of thinking about agency. I think especially discussing the agency that's exerted by African bureaucrats, and this could be, for example, civil servants or government officials, but we also included in the paper some specific technical and administrative aspects of, of, of the bureaucracy. And I think the part there is this processual understanding of agency, and so in shaping not only the, the incipit of it in the agenda setting or the outcome per se, but also the process through which it takes place. And so it can be, for instance, influencing the choice of contractor, or it can also be being responsible for, for planning through the formulation of development plans for, for, in this case, Ethiopia, right? And so shaping the ways in which the prioritization of projects is taking place and the specific actors that are participating to the negotiations and are sitting around the sort of negotiation tables uh, in terms of the uh, bureaucratic processes that go into implementing projects. And so, for example, in the case of Ethiopia, we really dig into how Ethiopia, the Ethiopian government, as part of the uh, of the state, was able to push in and, and shape the implementation through inserting some of their beliefs and values uh, that were part of the broader structural uh, dynamics in the country already. Um, so by restructuring the, the planning arrangements around financing or around, uh, for example, some of the, the aspects in the development of the wind farm and so their implementation, we're really advancing some of the, the uh, agendas of Ethiopia. And so it is through this, the governance structures of the bureaucracies that agency is enacted. And so I think it really, this again is a very context sensitive aspect of agency and it really depends from, of course, the um, the ways in which the implementation takes place, but also the way that different actors can negotiate their interests into the implementation process. And so in the case of the Adama farm, we see that happening through the bureaucracies, while, for instance, in the case that we just discussed with Bagamoyo, it was a, a presidential sort of approach 
uh, towards the, the non-implementation of a project. And in the case of Lamu Port, we see it even differently in a contestation that has more of a subnational character in it. Adding on to what Ellie has already said, I think the interesting part, particularly around the Ethiopian case study, is trying to understand African agency not as a basis of reacting or stopping um, projects that African governments are not happy with. You know, so this is the idea of basically initiating uh, this infrastructure deal. So this is quite an interesting, which is a bit different to what we have seen um, in the in the Tanzanian case study. Well, let's stick with Ethiopia, Frankton, in part because you've done quite a bit of research on the situation in Ethiopia related to the wind farms and others. How much of the different types of agencies that Elise has been talking about, bureaucratic agency, agency among political elites and so forth, how much of it is coordinated and how much of it is kind of very chaotic? And and, and this is one of the issues that Cobus has mentioned in previous discussions that the gap between the ruling and the ruled in Africa is among the widest in the world. So when we also talk about agency Whose agency is it in terms of for the state or for the political elites and maybe the personal benefit that they get from some of these infrastructure deals? I think Ethiopia presents a very, very interesting case study, particularly around this idea of African agency in Africa-China relations um, in the context of infrastructure development. I think what we have observed with Ethiopia has this continuity, bureaucratic continuity. Of course, there is continuous change of uh, political leadership or the elites, if you want, but in terms of the bureaucratic ecosystem, we see there's this, this continuity. And I'll say this um, particularly around, you know, the, these wind farms that we are talking about, where we have seen that those who are actually involved in negotiating these deals, um, you may be surprised that they have been part of these resp- uh, respective ministries or, you know, institutions for, you know, 10 plus or 15 to 20 years. And they have um, sort of a deeper understanding of how things should really work out on the ground. Of course, political elites, some to some extent, also you know shape and influence how these uh, bureaucrats operate. But I think in the Ethiopian case, we have seen this continuity, which plays a very very critical role, particularly around issues that are often commented on in terms of capacity of those involved in the um, in the negotiations. I was wondering how that kind of agency that 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 is really kind of you know, located within within the structure of the state or the structure of the bureaucracy, how that interacts with more popular agency that we see frequently in, in relation to Chinese projects where there would be, you know, for example, a popular, um, you know, kind of demonstration against either environmental impacts or against like, you know, kind of lack of local hiring. Like, you know, there's just several of these kind of key issues that, that come up very frequently. Like, where do you see the link between, between that kind of popular bottom-up agency and and those that kind of embedded in the context of the state. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a very very good question, and and this is also what we what we at least try to address um, in the in the article that we co-authored. We first of all we 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 consider the state as as a social relation. We um, I think very often when commentators and analysts speak about African agency, one looks at really at these elites as if they would act in complete isolation from, from, from their societies. I'm very much with Eric in, in, in his assessment that, of course, there are in various countries, by the way, not only in Africa, there is a gap between the, 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 rule, the rulers and the ruled, of course. Nonetheless, uh, any form of of, of agency, of state agency is always embedded in particular, well, one could call it state society relations. And this is what I guess what you're also pointing to, Kobus. These, for instance, these more popular bottom up forms of agency, they also directly or indirectly, of course, in some ways affect how bureaucracies um, would, would work, but also how political elites would work, because none of these state agents in inverted commas are acting in in isolation they are very much sort of embedded in 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 societal processes and this is something that we have seen in various african contexts if we look again at the standard gauge railway for instance at kenya because you spoke about it in the introduction we have seen that a project that was of course sold by the political elite in kenya as sort of the the, the, the development panacea, which would, which would resolve so many problems in, in, in Kenyan, in the Kenyan development sphere. 
There was quite a lot of support in the beginning. And then there was, of course, also as a result um, of contestation, the, the politics around it changed. And I think this is this is the interesting thing that, thing that we see and that Ali has, Elisa has underlined, this procedural way at looking at, at it. And in that way, this formal agency that is exerted by governments, we always need to analyze it in relation to processes that are happening within societies. If I can jump in, I think the, in, in our paper, I think what Tim has just mentioned is really evident in the, in the local cover, governance case study, because it really does have this sort of multiscalar and nature to it of, of looking at tensions in the implementation process, in the implementing bodies, uh, because of, in this case, the, the geographical distance between the centre and the periphery and the historical dynamics that, that play into that. And so I think this is uh, perhaps one of those moments where the tension between how the implementation structure is uh, supposed to work and then how um, it works in practice really come to, to light and to the forefront. And I, I do agree that that's uh, one of the things that we try to do uh, in, in the paper as well is to show the interrelatedness amongst these different spheres as well. So your paper stayed well within the confines of agency in the context of Africa and its relationship with various Chinese actors. It did not bring into the broader discourse about the perceptions of African agencies in the West and outside of Africa. So I want to bring in a couple different voices now to try and broaden our conversation. The first voice, and it's a nice transition into our discussion about Lamu and in southern Kenya, is from President Uru Kenyatta earlier this year. This was when Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi made his first trip overseas in January. That always begins in Africa. It took him to Kenya, where they commissioned a new oil terminal. And there was a very important statement and a very important quote that came out of this speech by President Kenyatta with Foreign Minister Wang Yi at his side. And I am sure that as we move forward with the kind of pace of development that we now have achieved, we will be able to say we have achieved an end to poverty. We will be able to say we have increased the opportunity of our people to get decent jobs through shipbuilding, through the special economic zones that will be developed as a result of Dongokundu being finished, through the dueling of the road from Kilifi, Mutuapa to Nyali, which will mean that people are able to move that much faster and much more efficiently. And I believe that this is what we need. Kenya, Africa does not need lectures. Kenya, Africa needs friends willing to work with us to achieve our goals and our aspirations. And today, through you, Minister, I want to thank the president, the government, and the people of China for being true friends indeed and meeting us at our point of need to be able to help us achieve the social economic development that we are achieving. Kenya, Africa does not need lectures. He could not have been more clear. And this question of how the West frames African agency in its relationship with China was also the topic of discussion in The Economist magazine, which did a special report earlier this month and at the same time had a companion video on YouTube where they talked about the question of infrastructure and Western concerns about Chinese engagement in Africa. And our old friend of the show, Jude Moore, from the Center for Global Development in Washington. He was prominently featured in this video. He is a former Liberian public works minister, so he is an expert in African infrastructure. He has negotiated with the Chinese himself, and he has been very, very critical of the way that the U.S. and Europe have framed much of the discussion about African agency with regards to the Chinese. Here's a little outtake from that video. You'll hear first the host of the video, and you notice the ominous music in the back, which usually comes with U.S. and European media coverage of the Chinese. But let's take a listen to The Economist video along with Jude Moore. Western concerns are inevitable and understandable. But all too frequently, Western policymakers forget that African leaders and people aren't just bystanders. 
this idea that Africans are sort of bamboozled and and sort of tricked into accepting a deal that that is actually not working for them infantilizes Africans and somehow they need Westerners to come and defend them from the shifty and and, and tricky Chinese. Franklin, let's come back to you. Two very important voices there. We don't need lectures. And Jude Moore saying that the Western narrative about African agency often infantilizes the, the African side of this. What's your reaction to both of those statements? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with some of these um, statements um, for the following reasons. I think what we have observed, particularly in the past 10 to 15 years, has been this idea of uh, the West sort of having a more or higher ground in terms of how to, you know, do development. And um, I think this is sort of embedded in the history associated with the whole um, sector of development. I think if you want going back to, um, you know, the post-World War II um, development policy and practice where basically the idea of development was envisaged on the experiences of um, uh, Western uh, Europe and Northern America. And they are very present even um, uh, in today's uh, world. And particularly, I think the rise of China and, you know, sort of the proliferation of relations between China and Africa has been seen particularly by some of these uh, Western um, uh, countries as sort of like a threat to their, if you want, uh, former neocolonial power. I mean, their their former sort of uh, zones of influence. And definitely China threatens that. And indeed, I think um, the uh, the Kenyan president there is correct to say that we don't have to be lectured in terms of how we can or how we should do development because this is something that should be homegrown. At the end of the day, development is all about uh, self-improvement and improvement depends on the context. Uh, but I think at the same time, I think we also have to be uh, very, uh, very careful, um, particularly listening some of these narratives which come from these, uh, if you want, African political elites who are probably been powerful ages. And in most cases, when they are called out um, for questionable governance practices, they have uh, these tendencies of throwing out these, you know, statements of sort of trying to um, and not fall into the lectures of the of the West. So I think we have to be really careful uh, in terms of assessing this um, this aspect altogether. If you allow me to, 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 to come in here as well, uh, obviously as an outside obs- observer from a, from, a, from a European vantage point, I think it's it's actually very interesting and, and our colleague uh, Moore described this very, very well, the hypocrisy of some Western decision makers and and commentators is just mind mind boggling we have of course also seen that in the context of the of the so called uh, alleged debt trap that that you covered extensively in your in your outlet as well where again western decision makers come in and uh, sort of pretend that they want to rescue um uh, Africa from 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 Chinese influence and from the alleged uh, debt trap, uh, forgetting uh, the fact that basically European and American institutions are the leading uh, the leading creditors uh, across the continent and uh, exert huge influence on on African uh, societies up until today. But it is very interesting, and we will see this pattern continuing. Some people have already spoken about a new Cold War that plays out in the global south and that plays out particularly in Africa with now the European and American actors sort of having woken up from their long time slumber, realizing the certainly the influence Chinese actors do have in the economic sphere, but also politically uh, across uh, the African continent. And it's very interesting again, and also hypocritical to see and to read these statements by Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, or also by Blinken uh, when he was in, in Senegal and in Nigeria end of last year, basically again stressing that uh, they can offer an alternative, uh, fairer way of development, um, emphasizing the partnership aspects that the Global Gateway would bring or the Build Back Better World. Um, so we see this competition playing out on the on the African continent, particularly this has also to do with the growing strategic importance Africa has uh, with regard to various supply chains, with regard to strategic resources, 
just one example when we think about uh, the transition towards green mobility uh, 50% of the global cobalt reserves as you know comes out of the DRC Congo um, the question of cybersecurity, 5G networks so we have this competition increasing and and we see very interestingly how this is then discursively framed by Western decision makers as a better alternative now to uh, uh, to to what china China can offer when he, when I want to bring it back to that question of what's what's in it for Africa and for African decision makers, Franklin has basically mentioned already it will very much depend on how African decision makers negotiate these deals uh, on to what extent inclusive development is really the goal. Is it short-term ribbon-cutting goals of one infrastructure project after the other without having a coherent idea how these projects should trickle down and basically have broad-based development? So in many ways, yes, this competition brings... Uh, a plus in African agency. This is also something that our that our colleague Fola Shade Sole has argued that this choice of development partners can bring more African agency. But nonetheless, and this is something that we argue in our paper, we need to look, look closely into political contexts and and look how basically the results of such projects are also the economic results whether they are distributed, where the profits go to, etc. And I think if I can add to that, I think uh, one of the, of the examples that um, you were mentioning earlier as well with the, for example, the Nairobi Expressway that just opened um, a little while ago, you know, we see that very blatantly as well, seeing these pictures from aerial views, seeing the expressway completely empty with very little traffic and then on the other side, the old road. Uh, crowded with, with trucks and cars and so on. And so again, I think we go back to uh, the question specifically related to infrastructure, of whether infrastru these infrastructure projects, whether they're uh, Chinese funded or, or Western funded, whether they are indeed suitable to the requirements of the users of this infrastructure, or whether perhaps they're serving a broader political um, political agenda uh, or profiteering agenda by by specific uh, branches of of the state and society, um, and so I think the linkage there between uh, whether it is state capture or perhaps profiteering of business elites or whether it is a movement towards land grabbing um, or perhaps whether it is a way to try and redirect um, the competition amongst development partners towards uh, the, the the projects that are underpinning the development agendas of African countries, and so attempting to direct them um, to specific projects that have a, that a transformative potential. Um, it is really a question that lies uh, with the African negotiators, and especially um, with those that uh, are able to influence the process. And I think that that's uh, where our the focus of our paper really lies into showing that there are uh, very different levels of governance involved and there's a very different uh, multiscalar and multi-temporal processes that are part uh, that are part of this of these negotiation processes. And so whether um, uh, this has to do specifically with Chinese funding or with Chinese contractors, uh, but it also reflects uh, broader patterns of, uh, of structural dynamics within African nations vis-à-vis -vis external partners. Franklin, you know, we, we're now already, you know, a, a while after the signing um, of the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, and I was wondering whether, whether you're seeing... Um, you know, increasing, you know, kind of proactive use of African agency towards to, to overcome kind of country to country competition in relation to infrastructure, in, in relation to business, um, you know, in, in, in terms of in, and, and in terms of whether you're seeing a, a movement forward in, you know, kind of in the in the setting up of a, a, a pipeline of projects that would be cross would be regional and are, are planned at kind of like development synergistic development, um, you know, kind of that that draws on the the strengths of 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 several countries at once, 
or are we still at the moment at a moment where where African agency in relation to China is mostly happening at the individual country level and therefore has remained kind of locked in the bilateral relation between China and that country? Thanks, thanks, Kobus. I think this is a comment we have uh, sort of uh, you know interacted with quite a lot, particularly around. Um, is is it more beneficial for Africans to sort of negotiate these deals individually or bilateral? In other words, like a country, um, an African country on its own versus the Chinese, or is better off if African countries can come together and then try to negotiate um, if you want these regional infrastructure projects, such as, for example, the Lapset, you know. I think um you know the signing of the of the free trade agreement in Africa I think is a step in the right direction uh, because at least it creates that avenue and opportunity for African uh, decision makers to collectively decide uh, what's best for them and I think maybe to just sort of emphasize that, that some of the discussions were already happening uh, even way before the uh, the collective uh, uh, trade agreement was 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 reached you know I mean the example of Lab said, you know, this is a, a regional uh, infrastructure project that would try to connect some of the East African countries. And I think there are several as well. If you check the Southern African region, the West African region, proposals, I think, are there. So it will be a matter of just trying to work out the implementation aspect of some of the already existing plans. I want to close our discussion on a little bit more of a sensitive issue. And, and this came up in the discussion on Twitter following when I posted the quote from Jude Moore and a an analyst who who follows this issue very closely and has been in many African foreign ministries, he, they sent me a a comment here. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't ask his permission before, so I have to not say who it is, but it's a very interesting comment. The truth is most countries in Africa do not have robust China studies, especially related to the CCP. And most African foreign ministries that I've visited had at most two or three working on China, and most had no language skills. That's real asymmetry, and to suggest it doesn't have a real effect on outcomes is wishful thinking, and doesn't accord with the outcomes we've witnessed again and again. This whole African agency thing is wishful thinking without the investment. And this question of the knowledge deficits around China is real. And one of the more discouraging aspects of the China-Africa relationship over the past 20 years is the fact that many African governments, if not most, have not really taken the challenge very seriously. They have not beefed up their their understanding of China. They've not brought on Chinese experts, Chinese language people. They've not brought on their staffs. And again, there are ample, ample human resources at their disposal, given the fact that 62, 63,000 African students were going to China, getting MBAs, getting PhDs, coming back with fluent language skills. So human resources was not the problem here. Tim, let's just get your take, and I'd like to get Elisa's as well, and Frankton, your your perspective on this. All of you have been studying China and China-Africa for a long time. What do you think of that comment from this this particular analyst whose assessment was that the asymmetry is accentuated and it undermines agency when there is such a poor understanding of China and Chinese. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's a very interesting point that is raised by by this um, uh, observer um, who seems to be who seems to 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 know uh, much better the in, the internal dynamics within African um, foreign ministries than I would be able to to assess. In many ways, he uh, or she. Uh, underscores our point because lack of certain capacities within state apparatuses, for instance, within foreign ministries, is an is one part of that structural context that we speak about in which each agent or in which agency is taking place. So in many ways, it it it, it is another example of how agency can be constrained. By, by various contexts, in this case, again, institutional contexts, potentially lack of, 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 um, of, of, of sufficient agency, lack of uh, expertise, sufficient um, staffing, for instance, as this commentator at least uh, argues. I would like to very briefly still connect this to, to, to Kobus' previous question. This is actually one reason why many observers, scholars, journalists, activists on the African continent have for decades argued, even before 
the rise of so-called rise of China and Africa. Even before that, you know, when we started negotiating um, the, the new Cotonou agreement, when we started negotiating the economic partnership agreements with the European Union, because this observer is not, you know, this assessment is not new, that there is certain capacity constraints within public administrations on the African part. And then you negotiate, for instance, again, vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission from Brussels. They send a delegation of, of 80 experts, um, all of them contract lawyers. So, so in many ways, this asymmetry has always been there. And coming back to what Corpus mentioned, there has, of course, been constant arguments also from Addis Ababa, not from the national government there, but from the African Union headquarters, saying we need to pool our resources so that we can negotiate better with be it China, be it the European Union, or be it now the US increasingly again. So this is, this is a key, um, has been a key demand again by scholars, by civil society actors, But the very important thing that we need to remember, and this goes more to Corbus's previous question um, than to yours, Eric, is even in the context now of the African um, Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement, we must not forget that there is also a two-level game played by many African decision makers and governments. They would enjoy the regional summitry, the continental summitry. They would sign all these deals, these agreements. Now it's the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. If we look at the regional economic communities, SADC, EAC, ECOWAS, for decades they have, they have strived towards becoming a customs union. So there has been commitment and pledges for decades to integrate African markets. But when you look at the balance sheet, you see a vast implementation gap. And we need to consistently ask, where does this implementation gap come from? It's not only the lacking capacity and resources in ministries, as this commentator has pointed out, that might be one aspect. The other is sheer lack of political will. In the post-colonial state has a particular intimate relationship to sovereignty, and there are... African decision makers who jealously guard their political authority and who do not really have the interest to really have a continental free trade agreement, which would mean basically um, giving part of control and political authority to another level of governance. So this is also a key issue that we need to that we need to put our fingers in, in our analysis and scholarly work or journalistic, journalistic commentary to really look at these double games that are played. Official commitment to regional initiatives, to continental initiatives, when it comes to the implementation, this vast implementation gap. So, Frankton and Elise, I'd like to get your take on this just very quickly before we go, because we're running out of time, about this knowledge deficit on China, that I, I agree with Tim that this is more about political will than a lack of capacity. This is a choice that these governments have made not to invest in their China knowledge. I'd like you to comment on that observer's comments and his statement. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that I've observed, especially in my, in my research in, um, in Kenya, is that the I mean, the knowledge and the institutional capacity is there. However, especially when it comes to infrastructure, there's often a gap in between subsectors. So if it is a port proposal, it will go to the port authority. If it is a road proposal, it will go to the highway authority. If it is a railway proposal, it will go to the railway authority. And so a lot of the institutional expertise is, is, is lost and there's mis mislinkages between them. So it's not perhaps always a lack of expertise overall or a lack of knowledge, but also institutional memory loss in some cases is a more of a thing than in others. For example, Frankton earlier was referring to the, the Ethiopian case and the continuity within the bureaucracy. So this is not often, not always the case in different contexts. So I'm th I think that uh, part of the, um, the discussion that Tim was mentioning earlier, this, this sort of two-level game, it fits really within broader dynamics of competition amongst the continent um, and different regions of it. We, if we think about uh, the development of transport corridors, there's often a very, uh, their development is often underpinned by competition dynamics to um, access to 
to experts from landlocked countries and, and a race towards the development of the infrastru- infrastructure around the continent. We've seen that in the, in the major increase in port investment, we've seen it with railway development, we've seen it with road development um, and construction as well. And so I think this, this competing dynamics amongst uh, countries and regions or amongst countries within specific regions really does play a huge role um, in setting the political agenda for infrastructure development. Frankton, you are going to get the last word. Yeah, I think I would agree with some of the uh, statements from the observer, not entirely. I think that we have a number of African countries that at least have demonstrated that they have the capacity to to negotiate with some of the of the Chinese or even um, non Chinese um, external players in Africa. I mean, certainly we have seen this uh, with um, uh, South Africa. We have also seen this with um, Ethiopia, where at least they there is that capacity um, um, for engaging with China. But yeah, largely I agree with the observer that um, there are capacity issues, uh, particularly around the deficit of knowledge around uh, China or Chinese um, in this context. And uh, we have seen some of the, uh, I will not mention the names of the countries, but in West Africa, where at least they are aware of these uh, limitations and they end up sort of hiring uh, if you want uh, external experts, it could be from Western countries or they could be from somewhere else that have a deeper understanding of China or the Chinese. And usually they'll deploy these experts to negotiate some of these uh, infrastructure uh, deals. So this could be potentially another way of looking at it. But obviously, this is a very, very short term uh, to medium, uh, medium term um, uh, plan. But I think it's broadly understood that in Africa, there are capacity issues. And we have seen a number of African universities setting up some research institutions or some research centers that are sort of training uh, the the future, um, you know, uh, personnel who will be involved in some of these uh, uh, um, uh, negotiating these deals. So, for example, we have seen like um, the Center for um, Chinese Studies. Uh, We have also, interestingly and increasingly, we have seen setting up even uh, centers studying non-Chinese. So, for example, I think at University of Witwatersrand, Rand, they have set up a center for the study of United States of America. And I think this is a step in the right direction in terms of trying to beef up these capacity issues. But equally, I think I agree with the observer that we have a number of African students already studying in China. And most of the times when they graduate, they just go back home. And in most cases, um, they are not really um, doing what they've trained uh, back in China. So so, so why, why, why can't um, most of these African uh, um, governments uh, make use of that capacity? You know, again, it links with the political we issue, uh, which has already been raised. The article is Infrastructure and the Politics of African State Agency Shaping the Belt and Road Initiative in East Africa. It was published in the Chinese Political Science Review. It's a little bit on the academic wonky side, but an absolutely fascinating read. Frankton Chiamura is a lecturer in international development at the Open University in Milton Keynes, was one of three authors, along with Elisa Gambino, a fellow in the International Politics of China in the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics, and Tim Zayons, a lecturer in International Relations and Global Political Economy at the University of Freiburg in Germany, all contributed together. I am going to put links to the article and all three of your Twitter handles so that people can follow all the exciting things that you're reading and writing these days. Frankton, Elisa, and Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today to talk about your fascinating paper. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Kobe, so much to digest there. It's a thick paper. It's, again, for people who are not in the academic space, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to get through these papers, but absolutely worthwhile. Really, really fascinating. This question of agency is so important right now because as we heard from some of the commentators, whether it was our anonymous commentator or Jude Moore or even the president of Kenya, talking about how agency is framed from the outside looking in towards Africa and then how Africans themselves towards their leaders frame it and then certainly vis-a-vis the relationship with the Chinese. So I want to come back to this question that Tim and Elisa and even Frankton brought up on this question of political will. And this is what makes it difficult to feel sorry for African governments that are getting bum deals from the Chinese and others, that if they're not making the investments in their own capacity to negotiate better deals, to negotiate terms like what we're seeing out here in Asia, where Indonesia 
is forcing the Chinese to come and invest in processing raw materials. Nickel, for example, they just said, that's it. We're not exporting the nickel. If you want it, you're going to have to process it here. Again, it's not fair to compare uh, Southeast Asian governments with that of African governments, in part because of the millennia of experience that they've had in dealing with the Chinese. But there is something to be said about the need for African governments to take China more seriously. And that means you have to invest in getting good people on your teams. You have to listen to these people. And enough with the fact that you're not from the right political group, the right family and whatnot. And and I think that's been holding back a lot of African governments. And by the way, this is not a phenomenon that is unique to Africa at all. Tribal politics in the United States are absolutely now pervasive, and it also exists in Europe as well. The stakes, though, for for many African governments are quite high given the disproportionate size of China's engagement in their countries. So that's just something to take in mind. What is your uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think these these factors play a role. Um, I think one should also look at um, at interagency dynamics within within these governments. Um, you know, so so Fulashare Sole, for example, has, has shown in some of her research that um, that where in, in in cases of of, of successful negotiation with with Chinese um, actors. Um, frequently, the African governments would, would do a lot of work to, to kind of try and pull together all of these, all of the the kind of competence and, and viewpoints from a lot of different different um, government de, uh, government departments and ministries. And they would even do kind of like these kind of retreats, you know, kind of with all of these officials somewhere, somewhere in order to, to really only focus on the deal, but to pull in all of this capacity from all of these different ministries. And I think, that, like as um, as Elisa pointed out, like in some cases, you know, <clears throat> you, you you don't actually see that. You know, kind of in some cases, like you know, if it's a port thing, then they only talk to the ports ministry. Um, so in that sense, I think you know, kind of really, really kind of making the most of of the the ability and and capacity that's already in the government structures, you know, is is already a, a really big step forward. Well, let's leave our discussion there. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do two shows this week because we've got some travels. I just came back from Cambodia. Cobus is off to West Africa. But once we kind of settle down, uh, we will get back into our two-show rhythm. I'll be heading off to the Middle East, and we're going to do some shows from the Middle East. And then I'll be in Washington later this summer as well. So that'll be very exciting. And I'm going to have a chance to meet a lot of listeners and also a lot of our subscribers to our newsletter, which I'm really excited to do. Finally, we can travel again. So it's really exciting to be able to do that. We would love for you to become a part of our daily community. We produce a newsletter that now goes out to thousands of subscribers in government, in diplomacy, in multilateral organizations, scholars, practitioners, people in the business are getting it. This is very much a B2B thing. It's pretty hardcore. You basically every single day get about two to 3,000 words of about 15 stories of everything China's doing in the global south, from the South Pacific to South Asia to South America, uh, obviously a lot of African news and, and Middle Eastern as well. We've got services now in Arabic and French, and our whole team is contributing to put this together. And what makes it exciting is that all of us are actually in the global south. None of us are sitting in London, in New York, in in Paris writing this stuff. We are writing it from the ground perspective in the global south looking outward. So we would love for you to subscribe and to join our community and to support the important journalism that the team is doing in Africa and Asia. Go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Or if you'd like to support this podcast, which we are eternally grateful, and we've got some new Patreon supporters, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash China Africa Project. I still haven't changed the URL on that, so we'll get those aligned in the next week or so. But that'll do it for this edition of the show. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrique on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.